Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to Teaching We the People at the Middle School Level. My name is Mark Gage. I am the Director of Publishing for the Center for Civic Education. This webinar is for middle school teachers who are new to the We the People program and anyone interested in learning more about We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution, which has reached more than 30 million students since 1987. And with that, I will turn it over to Maria Gallo. Director of Professional Development and Special Programs here at the Center for Civic Education. Over to you, Maria. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, and welcome to everyone. I'm going to try and share my screen at this point and see whether or not we are able to actually get this going. So as Mark Gage has said, we are going to, we at the Center are going to do a How to Teach We the People in a Middle School class. You're going to have Robert Lemming, our National Director of the We the People Program and Curriculum. Um, he will be interjecting from time to time. Uh, you have myself, Maria Gallo, and you also have Mark Gage, who has already introduced himself. And we actually have a practitioner with us today. Her name is uh, Patience LeBlanc. She is the instructional coach of ELAR and Social Studies at the Frisco School District. But she only just started this job and up until last, well, up until we were distance learning in June, um, she was actually teaching middle school students. She also happens to be the judge and a timer and, and a facilitator and everything you could think of at the National Invitational for us in Washington, DC. She's also a wonderful mentor at the Texas Bar Association in law related education, as, as well as a, a wonderful mentor for us. And she also happens to be our moderator for the Civic Forum. So we are going to get a chance to learn a little bit about that. But there are some decisions that you're going to have to make. And I'm not going to tell you which decisions you should make and which you should not. Um, obviously, if you are in this course, you've already determined as a seventh or whether you're a seventh or eighth grade teacher, but you might be both. And so you're wondering, do I do this in seventh grade? Do I do this with my eighth grade class? Some states have a survey course that goes on uh, in American history uh, all the way uh, for a full year. Others, on the other hand, have only the first half of American history in up to the Civil War in seventh grade and then from Reconstruction forward uh, in the eighth grade. So it's going to be up to you. Um, in, for example, in New York State, where I just came from, um, well, I shouldn't say where I just came from. I feel like I'm always there. Um, I am always going to, and I'm probably always going to feel that way. Um, they started a brand new curriculum in um, this year which is a curriculum specifically for seventh and eighth grade um, where they're going to do New York State history in conjunction with the American history over a two-year period. Uh, when I was teaching there, it was only uh, seventh grade was New York State history and eighth grade was American history, a survey course. So now how will I teach this? Am I going to teach this over six weeks? Am I going to teach this over a semester? excuse me, am I going to teach this over the course of the entire year? It's really going to be up to what are your standards and what are your performance standards? And not just in social studies or American history or history social science, but what about your ELA standards? What are they all about? What are they requiring you to do? What does your school district require you to do besides your social study standards? And so I think you're going to have to take all of that into account. So today or tonight, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the curriculum itself. Uh, and I think it is important for us to determine uh, what the curriculum is going to be, the who, the what, the where, the when, the how, all of that wonderful stuff, the hearing, and, and of course, all of the supportive materials that we have for you, because we never anticipate or expect that a teacher would just be given material and off they go to teach. It's going to be, uh, if, if you need help, we're there for you. Um, but it does pay 
to actually look at the material very, very much in hand. For example, you can see that the level two book, the middle school book, um, is, this, is divided into six units. We have five to six units in every, in every, I mean, five to six lessons in every unit. We have about 30 lessons in all. But look at the questions, look at the book. It does pay to know a little bit about your students and a little bit about you. Our books do not specifically say middle school, high school, or upper elementary. They say level three, level two, level one, and you could pretty much tell your kids whatever that level means to you, that you want to say to them that it's going to mean to you. But the bottom line is it's going to depend on the reading ability of your students. Um, but all of our units, as well as our lessons, are questions, and that can be very, very helpful to us. Now, not every single one of them is an essential question. Some of them are hooks, some of them are leaders, some of them are guiding questions, and some of them, of course, are essential questions. So if you're into the questioning, you have to know what it is. Um, what else do we do? We do scaffolding, which is available in each and every lesson. And I'm sure that patients will talk a little bit about this when, it's, when um, I ask her to please interject. Um, another word for scaffolding can be chunking. Uh, we're, going to add, we're going to tell you that there are three ways in which the lessons, every single lesson can be chunked. Um, it could be through your vocabulary. I, I, obviously in the vocabulary, where we give you suggestions, but the reality is that you as a teacher have to determine the best way to handle the vocabulary. The answers are in the glossary, which are both in the student book as well as the teacher edition. And you have the ability to either provide the students with the answers, look for the answers, whether it's a word, uh, a word wall or a, um, you're asking them to do some logs, that's going to be totally up to you. But you might ask them to take a look at some of the pictures, don't mind me. Uh, why, was the, why was the rigid class system of England hard to maintain in the American colonies? Again, it's just a small chunk. Uh, the lesson itself, every section is chunked. So, and there, especially in the beginning, they're small chunks. Why, for example, why study the British colonies in North America? I mean, there's maybe three, two and a half to three paragraphs un underneath that. It's a simple concept to get through. And, and almost 99.9% .9 of our segments are also questions. So that it, it, as students have the opportunity to look at each segment, they have the opportunity to determine whether or not they're going to take a look at um, uh, be able to answer a question. We also spiral our content. Uh, important ideas such as citizens, which by the way, the word citizen appears about 305 times in this book, but I think you need to look at particular lessons. For example, 1, 11, 15, 16, 25, and 30 have very specific comments about citizens or about the common good, which appears in particular in lessons three, four, uh, 10, 15, 28, 29, and 30. But you will also happen to notice that in lesson 15, which is common to both of them, you will have what do you think questions in every lesson, almost every lesson, not every single lesson, but 99% of the time you will find what you think questions. And this is an opportunity for students to actually think about what they're talking about. And so, whether they do it individually or whether they do it as a group, you're always going to have the opportunity to do what you think questions. And you will notice that you really can't answer these questions without A, knowing what a citizen is, B, knowing what the common good is, and C, what's going to be new here, is the general powers of Congress or the enumerated powers of Congress, which the kids need to know, but they won't understand how to answer this or their, question, their answers to their questions will not be as good if they don't know what a citizenship, what citizens are or what the common good is. All of, almost every single one of our pictures has captions. And this is the ability for you to really 
not let any kid feel like they are left out. Um, this lesson happens, these pictures happen to come in, in unit one very, very early on. You will notice that on the left, you will see what did John Locke mean by a state of nature? And it is a simple question to answer if that's what you choose to do. Answer the idea of state of nature, but define it. Define it as John Locke did. Here though, on the, on the, on the right, we have a slightly more complicated version. Sorry about that. A slightly more complicated version. And that is how I might, how in a state of nature, how might one's life, liberty and property be protected? So here they have to know the definitions of state of nature, life, liberty, and property in order to be protected. Um, by, so this is a much more complex kind of question. And some of your kids may very well be able to answer this question right away. The object is that by the end of lesson 30, which is the end of the book, or the end of the curriculum, your kids, no matter who your kid is, will be able to answer this type of question. But certainly in the very beginning, especially where you do see a difference between your students, I do not think it's a good idea to have every kid need to answer the same question. Um, critical thinking exercises can be used to introduce cooperative learning strategies. We have them in every single lesson and in every single unit. And what I have done is given you an example from unit one, lesson two, but I've also given you some titles of, of these critical thinking exercises from units two through six um, and the individual lessons in which you could find them. You will also find that very often these lessons or these critical thinking exercises can be used for class discussions, uh, to get people ready for the hearing. So at this individual moment, I'm gonna, oh, I'm sorry, I have one more thing before I turn it over to patients and that is reviewing and using the lesson. And you will see that this happens at the end of every single lesson we have reviewing and using the lesson. It is your ability to either assign the questions for homework. It is a review of the things that they have discussed during the day. I've given you a sample of some questions from lesson two and a sample of some questions from lesson 28. Uh, you can see the different types of questions. So hopefully you'll be able to see the scaffolding and spiraling from each of them. But more importantly, regardless of what we suggest in the lesson plan, use these questions to your advantage. Patience, do you have anything you would like to talk about uh, as far as any of this is concerned? Yes, I was going to uh, talk about the book and just, I love the features that you showcased uh, for our um, participants today, but specifically, I love just that Socratic uh, method that happens throughout the book. Like Maria said, the titles of the, the units are done in questions, the lessons are done in questions, uh, all of the, the pictures and the cartoons that are in this book are amazing. And I often use the pictures and the cartoons as introductory warm-ups, exit tickets, the questions underneath the pictures, the captions that she was mentioning are just fantastic in leading discussions in your class. Um, you know, within the lessons, there are some activities that are already built in to this textbook. Um, I will tell you, I use this textbooks in my class, especially when I get to the Constitution unit. Um, as a middle school teacher, I teach eighth grade. And I've used this book often when I get to my constitution unit, when you, when you are studying uh, the Declaration of Independence and leading all the way up to, through the convention um, and into you know just the steps of the, the government standards that you have to teach, this textbook covers it all. Uh, one thing that I love about this textbook, if you take this textbook and you compare it to maybe a textbook that your district has purchased, I promise you, you'll probably go to the We the People textbook. Uh, it is just user friendly. The students like it a lot better. The reading um, uh, ability is much easier. And um, 
Uh, Maria mentioned the scaffolding and the chunking. It's really neat to assign students um, specific. So if you think about your textbook in your classroom, you know, you may have the Constitution unit. There may be 30, 40 pages from that Constitution unit. The way that the We the People book is structured, it makes it much easier and doable for students because of the way it's chunked. Um, and um, I, I've, I've just really, I've, I've used this book, uh, the middle school book, uh, level two, again, we call it level two, uh, probably for about 20 years now. Maria, did you go away? No, 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 I didn't go away. I, I couldn't get myself to unmute. So I'm really very sorry about that. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Patience. I did not mean to, to, to disappear on you like that. Um, the hearing which is the next part of the curriculum, but you kind of need to know what the hearing is before you decide whether you wanted to do it competitively or non-competitively. So I'm going to give you what we consider a very traditional hearing, and then it's going to be up to you to make the decision as to how you want to do it um, in your class with your students. So the traditional hearing is you break your class up into six units, if that's the level two book that you're using, you're gonna break them up into six units. Once you've taught the material, they get three questions a piece. Um, each unit has three questions. Those questions are found in the teacher's edition, uh, which I will go over with you a, a little bit later. And um, you will be able to assign to each of your groups uh, the opportunity to answer those questions. Now. I got to tell you, they're pretty complex kinds of questions, but they have four minutes to respond to those questions. And then they put all their notes away if they used any. And there are six minutes of follow up questions. So, altogether, each group has 10 minutes worth of hearing. And in the, in the non competitive, it's up to you to determine how you're going to actually do that, if you're going to do that. And in the competitive approach, um, you the kids have to answer all three of those questions and then you really don't know which question you're going to get asked. And of course, it's we're not just talking about you, but we're talking about other teachers, superintendents, principals, assistant principals, congressmen, anyone you can get from the community to be a part of this program is what we would like you to do. But so let me give you a little piece of the, let me give you one example. And that is one question that comes from this. Whether you go in competitively or non-competitively, you have a question before you. You can find it either in your um, textbook. Uh, it's in the back of the teacher's guide. It, all of the questions for each unit are in the back of the teacher's guide or you can find them online, which I'm going to recommend if you spend any time at all with the textbook that you also spend time uh, on our website, especially not just the Center for Civic Education's website, which you will get the URL again, so you don't have to worry about racing to try to, to find it right here and right now. But uh, the very first program that's listed on that page is project is um, excuse me is we the people the citizen and the constitution and project citizen happens to be the second so you you would go in there and if I were you I would spend some quality time on that website because it really does give you a plethora of information and it is all free of charge we do refer to these questions that are in your textbook or, or in the teacher's edition or the teacher's guide of your textbook as district level questions, just so that you know that there is a difference. So let me show you the first question, which is here. Uh, it is one of the questions in the book. You will notice that the last question is definitely the last part, the last bullet is definitely an essential question. It has all of the markings of an essential question Bec and more importantly, it will change. Their answers will change from the beginning of learning about John Locke to the very end to as they move on in their own individual lives. I think that that answer will change. So that becomes super important. Um, in the non-competitive approach, 
you could break up that question. So for example, um, you had in your question, um, you had three bullets. Well, maybe if you're doing an un a, 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 a non-competitive event, you might break up the question. At the end of the unit one, you might only assign them a part of the question, or you may, since there's three different questions, you might look at them and break up your class into six groups and actually assign, or, or nine groups, and actually assign them a piece of one of those. Uh, you can complete one question at the end of each unit. You can determine, for example, after you have taught all of unit one, you might want to break your class up and actually do uh, all of do unit one. And so the reality is it's going to be up to you how big and how small your class is, how large you're going to make those particular uh, groupings. The mini hearing, I will tell you, I got a chance to see and I thought it was absolutely beautiful because it was something that was done at the end of every unit and there were no follow-up questions. There's just the questions themselves and the kids get to answer them. Um, and I think that that's phenomenal because it's absolutely interesting to hear how different kids will answer a similar or the same kind of question. And the fact that there are no follow-ups means that they are really just kind of coming up with whatever it is that they would like to come up with. You could do a class hearing where just your individual class is there. You could choose to do all three questions. You could choose to do two. You could choose to use only one question. You could choose to have student input. There's a million ways in which you could do this. Now, any one of these can be standalones as you want them, or you could have them prepare you for the competitive hearing. Now, I'm going to tell you that you could do it amongst your classes. You could do it in your school if you get other teachers involved. Uh, you could do it formally. Um, we love to call ourselves a family. Well, here's an opportunity for you. Um, you can enter if you would like, maybe not this year, maybe next year or a little bit down the road. Uh, I would strongly recommend contacting your state coordinator, which if you go to um, our website and you go to the We the People program and you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see an interactive map just like I have up here. The difference is that this map is actually kind of static, but if I actually go to California or I actually go to the state of New York, I, it'll say California, it'll say New York, and then if I click on it, it'll give me uh, who that state coordinator is, uh, it'll give me all the contact information that they have allowed us to put up. And I think it's important for you because there might be some professional development. There might be some free books involved in the program. So, there, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons for you to actually, whether you want to do this competitively or not, for you to contact your state coordinator. Um, and if you don't want to play with the map on a regular basis, there's also a little thing at the, at the underneath the map that just allows you to choose your state and it will take you right there. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, supporting materials. I'm sorry. Patience. I'm, we're back to you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay, Maria. I, I didn't want you to skip me because I really do like to talk about the hearing, even though I absolutely adore the books um, and I use it every year in my class. Uh, the hearing is one of those experiences that you just really have to experience. You know, as an educator, as a teacher, I'm always looking for different ways to assess my students. And I'm, you know, we're all used to the multiple choice questions, uh, standard questions, but if you're looking for an authentic assessment, this congressional hearing or this mock hearing is, is one of the, the best assessments I, um, I've ever seen with kids. Um, and like Maria said, there's many, many, many ways to do this. The first year that I ever got the books, I decided to try out the hearing with literally one unit. I chose one unit and it was the Constitutional Convention unit. And I divided my kids and I literally just gave them one question. And the neat thing about the hearing is, again, it's an authentic assessment. It helps kids work on 
other skills as well. Because the kids have to uh, write, they have to answer the question, they have to use their resources, they have to cite things. So you've got writing skills that are involved, research skills that are involved. Because the hearing is an oral assessment, the students have to practice speaking. So you've got speaking skills. And because they are in a group of their peers, um, anywhere from like three students uh, to five students. If, um, you know, I taught in a class where we had 34 students in my class and often would have to go to seven students in a group. But what they learn is civil discourse. They learn how to take turns speaking, how to speak as a group. So there's a lot of skills that go in this authentic assessment that, you know, you can't just get from a, a regular paper and pencil test. And so the hearing is a wonderful thing. You can make it, and as Maria said, you can make it as small in your classroom. I would definitely start out really small, thinking about maybe one lesson, one unit, or maybe even one question that all of your students participate in. But then every year, get a little bit more bold. I know that I started off very small, uh, Maria and I talked the other day that it's also great to, to invite other teachers into your class. Uh, if you're a teacher, you know how kids act very different when there is a visitor to your class. So invite your neighbor teacher, invite the science teacher, invite, you know, another, an English teacher. Um, you know, I always would email my teachers and say, hey, you know, can you give my kids 10 minutes for you for them to present something to you? And, you know, your fellow teachers will always help out. This is also great if you're needing to do um, some evaluation with a principal, invite that principal to see this authentic assessment and to be part of this uh, uh, um, program. It, it's a really great way to, to get some extra brownie points. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I've done it as small and I've also taken my kids competitively as well um, and have done the whole book with all the units, the district questions, and then of course uh, we get to the state questions um, as well. And I, I taught high school for a while um, and I taught my, took my kids to the national, uh, excuse me, to the state competition. Uh, we never made it to the national competition, but the kids competing, you know, there is something about a competition that gets kids more focused into what they're learning. Um, at the middle school level, um, when I was doing it, uh, we didn't really, you know, our state doesn't allow us to travel so much. So I actually created a competition and my school district where we had teachers compete. It's a great after school program. Uh, parents are invited to watch. Uh, we, we invited congressmen to come and give away the, the, the awards. Um, it's a great just community event that you can make it. And that's the great th thing about this program is you can do it literally in your class with just the students presenting to you as the teacher, and then you can do it as big as you want by creating your own competition um, and getting other teachers involved. And so I highly, highly recommend uh, that you try it out. And we are always here to help you walk through um, and think through how to set a competition up, a set a, a hearing up in your classroom. Maria? Thank you. Did I Sorry about that, Maria. It looks like you are muted. Maria, can you uh, unmute yourself? Maria, are you there? Started my what? video. There you can go. Can you hear me now? I'm so you sorry about unmuted. that. No uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you very much, Patience. I think that all of that is very, very important. And I, and especially coming from someone who's actually been in the classroom and who's actually not only use the curriculum material, but actually use the hearing in its authentic assessment mode, I think is very, very important. Um, many of our state coordinators actually have state competitions for the high school kids, and they, and they do showcases for the middle school kids. But I want you to know we have something called on the national level, the National Invitational. That means that any school can apply. You don't have to win. We do ask that you have com completed some sort of a simulation in your classroom, some sort of a hearing event that your kids have performed for before they come to us. 
It's usually at the end of April, the beginning of May, and it is, um, well, normally it was held in, Was in, in Virginia, but at, near Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, uh, this year it was online, but maybe not so unfortunately because we were able to keep people protected and safe as well as, but still they had a grand old time doing this. And we still had lots of opportunities. So your district or your state level competition this year may actually be virtual instead of in person. Please check with your state coordinator as to what they are planning to do. And if, and like I said, if there's something that you need, uh, we're here for you as well as your state coordinator is always there for you. Um, supporting materials. Uh, we have several, actually we have a lot of supporting materials. So I'm gonna start with the teacher's guide because I think that that becomes super important. Um, we lovingly refer to the front matter um, because it gives you a complete overview, not just of the program, but of the student text. It gives you a format for how the teacher's guide is created. Um, it, it lists all of that stuff. It gives you the, the characteristics of a civic education programs, but it also gives you teaching methodologies. For example, how do you do a town hall meeting? How do you do a pro se court? Um, all of those things, we don't expect that every single teacher, although I'm going to say that most teachers probably already know this material and probably could tell it to us better than we're telling it to you, but there may be one or two or that you don't know yet or that you need to have a little extra information on, that's there for you. Um, so under teaching methodology, we have that, including how you are going to do, there are three exercises on how you, how you could do, use writing. Uh, remember that we expect you to use uh, ELA standards as well as social studies standards in this. And how do you evaluate student achievement? How do you do any of the reflection? Because I think it becomes important for students to actually reflect on what the process is for their learning and not just the lessons, but also the hearing. What have they learned? What could they have done better? What could, what could they as an individual as well as as a group have done better. And I think that that those kinds of things are going to be there. Now, suggested lesson plans. Right after that, we go right into our lesson plans. Remember that only you know your students the best. So we are just making suggestions here. Um, all of our lesson plans follow the same model. You might choose to use only our objectives. You may choose to use only the, um, uh, the uh, vocabulary, whatever it is, that you want that's there for you. Um, and then of course the back matter, which has a list of free resources for you as a teacher. It also has the reading list for teachers and students. And I, I, it does have appendices A through D. Now, obviously prior to that, we have the constitution, the declaration of independence is all in there for you. But what about A through D? I want you to pay very particular attention to um, Appendices A, which has all the testing requirements. Now, earlier, patients talked about authentic assessment, but she also talked about paper and pencil tests, which are still very, very important to you, to your school, to your school district, probably your state. And so the multiple choice are there. There's a large test there, but it's also got correlations to the individual lessons. So you don't have to give your students the test all at once, however you would like. And C explains how to conduct a hearing. And I think that becomes very, very important as well, especially because a lot of what we're saying, I, I'm sure there's a lot that we're missing because we've been a part of it, we have done it. And so we may be talking about things th that you're sitting there going, huh? How is that possible? How do you do that? Well, this will give you the A through Z, at the A, literally A through Z on how to conduct a hearing in your classroom. Um, strategies for struggling readers. I didn't correct that. Um, strategies for struggling readers is very, very important because um, it does, a, it, not every kid is going to naturally be on grade level when it comes to reading. And we have to make a determination between 
where is the transition point between learning how to read and reading to learn? That transition point has to exist somewhere. And it does. Um, they, we actually have these materials for both high school and middle school. Um, the, the, it's a little bit old on the research, but I can assure you I've gone through it. The research is still valid. Um, certainly, we still use every one of the diagrams that are there from everything from how to deal with pre-readers to how to elicit information that's already inside of them and they don't even realize how to do a compare and contrast. All of those diagrams can be found in your struggling readers and your, your students may not be struggling readers, but you might still want to use these diagrams. So why not? I, I mean, you know, you, you, you might want to take a look at this. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mark Gage. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to stop talking for a little bit. <laughs> and I'm going to let Mark talk, handle this. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, thank you for that. It's very interesting. Let me um, share with you uh, my screen. So Maria was just talking about uh, the resource materials, some of the resource materials that we have, uh, the strategies for struggling readers. And that's on our, you can find a lot, a lot of this on our resource materials page. And I shared with you in the chat, the link to um, the strategies for struggling readers, which is right here. Let me just go into uh, the, our learn.civiced.org page or, or website. This, uh, so with, with this website, it is a free professional development site uh, for teachers. It has, and it's specifically geared for We the People teachers, which is wonderful, but it can also be used for any civics and government teacher. And let me just go ahead and, ahead and explain to you how to create an account. Basically, uh, it's of course a free login. I would recommend signing in with either your Microsoft, Facebook, or Google account. That way you don't have to remember a separate password for this account. If you, uh, if you don't want to do that, you can also click on manual account login and create a, a username and password that way. But I'll show you how I do it. I just log in via Google. I timed out, so I'll just uh, press continue. Uh, log in via Google, and there I am. And I'm just going to go ahead and use this as a student as, instead of as administrator. And there I am. I'm a student and I'm uh, uh, using this uh, uh, free site. And let me just show you a few features of this. First of all, there are four sections. We've got open courses, instructor-led courses, a civics forum, and resources. Uh, in the open courses section, uh, there are two free courses that are specially designed for We the People teachers. Um, and I'll show those to you right now. Uh, this first one is the We the People Open Course. The We the People Open Course is a self-paced free course uh, that will teach you everything. It'll teach you a, a, a really good in-depth background on the We the People curriculum. Now this particular course is designed uh, for, it reflects specifically the We the People High School book, but just to explain what that means, it can be used by teachers at any level. The high school book basically is a more, all three levels, the elementary, middle, and high school book uh, cover basically the same material, but each level covers it at a different le level of depth. So it's perfectly um, uh, appropriate for high school or middle school or elementary school teachers. So you'll, you'd feel comfortable using this. Uh, and let me just go ahead and, and show you uh, what it is. So the We the People open course, and you, just, you can just enroll yourself in the course. It's free, self-paced, and open. Um, it is divided into six units. That might sound familiar to you. There are six units in the text. And the lessons here actually correspond to the high school book, but I think you'll find them very useful for you. Uh, they go into great detail on every lesson and every section. So all the concepts of We the People um, at, in great detail. And basically, these are scholars who um, go into, who are experts in their, in their domains, who will explore different, uh, the different ideas that are found in the curriculum. Uh, and those are found at all levels. So as you see, we have uh, the lesson here and then the section, um, which is a part of the lesson. 
And let me just show you, I'm going to actually page down and show you lesson two. Uh, what do the Greek and Rome, how did Greek and Roman thought influence at least some of the founders? So if you go into the video, so each section starts out with a video and then follows up with questions. So I'm going to go ahead and play a little bit of this video for you. And it will start. Well, let's turn then to the second lesson of unit one, which addresses the question, what ideas about civic life inform the founder's generation? Let's start with the Greeks and Romans. How, how did Greek and Roman thought influence at least some of the founders? Well, as we talked about a little bit earlier, at least some of the colonists had studied writers such as Plato and Aristotle and Cicero. Plato and Aristotle focused on the importance of good political associations. They assumed that they were natural, but they also knew that no matter what form a political association takes, it can degenerate into what is bad. Um, Aristotle, who... All right, I won't play the whole video for you, obviously. Uh, this is about a seven minute video, but um, there are 100 and I believe it's 180 of these videos that go into in depth into the curriculum. So I guarantee that once you finish this course, you will have a pretty thorough background in the uh, intellectual foundations of the course. So if I uh, go home again, I'll show you the Strengthening Democracy in America open course. Now we have, uh, it, it works in the same way. You just go down here and you uh, enroll yourself in the course. And um, we have right now, uh, let's see, four videos, four courses, I should say. It's, uh, each course is composed of numerous videos. And uh, those four courses will expand to 10 um, by the beginning of December of this year. Um, and basically, it follows a very similar format, except that there's part one and part two. Part one is an overview of the political system created by the framers of the Constitution. And that is more information about the intellectual foundations of our system of government. And we have expert, two experts here, uh, Professor, Professor Jack Barlow of Juniata College and Bill Galston, William Galston, who's at the Brookings Institute. Uh, so uh, these two give you much more information about the founding of American government. And this second part goes into the strengths and weaknesses of uh, our system of government and how the strengths can be enhanced and how the weaknesses can be diminished. So for example, uh, in, in some of the videos we talk about the Electoral College. Obviously there are strengths and weaknesses to the Electoral College. Um, you know, uh, so we, the scholar in this case goes into, well, what are some proposals to strengthen, uh, you know, to, to resolve the weaknesses that are inherent in the Electoral College? What are some of the proposals that are out there? What are being tried? Uh, so uh, these give you more of an, uh, an idea about the contemporary issues uh, that are, are, are part of today's constitutional uh, system of government in the United States. All right, so, so that was the learn.civicedad.org um, page. Now you can see how long each one of them takes. Uh, the open course takes about six weeks. If you go six to eight hours per week, once again, it's self-paced. There is no, um, there is no, uh, you know, you don't have to complete it in any certain time period. There are also true, false, and uh, and short essay questions. And the short essay questions, the way it works, you put in your answer to the question, and after that, you get to see how other people answered the question, and maybe learn from from what they said. Um, and uh, this one is uh, one week per course, roughly. And right now there are four courses and soon there will be 10. The next thing I want to show you is our webinars. So if you go to civiced.org slash webinars, and I'll share this URL with you later, um, you will find our collection of webinars. We've got current webinars and then our past webinars, that is our archive webinars. Let me go into current webinars. So this is yet another free professional development tool that we are offering to our Be The People teachers. So if you click on uh, learn more for the Power to the People webinars, you will find that we have a list of seven weekly webinars. And this is an ongoing series that uh, is, is uh, the next one is gonna start tomorrow. So the first one was on Constitution Day and this was an overview 
of uh, the Supreme, the last Supreme Court uh, session. So of the major cases, and we go into the cases here, and you can watch the video right here. Um, we have a whole group of six more um, webinars. The first one, the one uh, that's occurring tomorrow, is the power of Indian sovereignty. Um, this is a very interesting webinar with uh, David Wilkins, a scholar at the University of Richmond. And he'll be talking about, you know, what does native sovereignty mean? We also have uh, the power of movements, the, str the struggle to pass the 19th Amendment uh, on the 100th anniversary of the passage of ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, we also have the power of symbols, monuments, and flags. Uh, that is an interesting one. The power of the criminal justice system, power of free speech. Last but not least, the power of voting. This one will take place right before the election on October 29th. Feel free to ask your kids. I mean, I know middle school kids, maybe this is a little advanced for them, but you know, if you teach at any other, at the high school level, I think it'd be appropriate for them. Uh, and in any case, it'll help you as a teacher understand these issues better so that you can better explain them to your kids. And okay, so that was the uh, Power to the People series. We've got past webinars here. This one is about teaching in a COVID environment. It took place on August 5th, right when we were, we were heading into the new school year and teachers sharing how they're going to uh, tackle the, uh, the new COVID reality. And this one right here, I wanna draw your attention to, and you can play these videos just by clicking here, uh, is teaching We the People Online using Actively Learn. Now our Actively Learn eBooks are enhanced eBooks, um, and those are only $9 per user per year. And this teacher, um, this is Amanda Kropp, who teaches 12th grade at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia. She's been using the, the We the People Actively Learn book for a few years. And in this video, she teaches you how to use it, how to teach it, what are all the ins and outs. Uh, so I think you will find that very interesting. Now, this is, I just want to explain to you, how do you keep in, in touch with the Center for Civic Education? How do you find out about all the wonderful things we have um, to offer you? Well, the best way I would suggest is to subscribe to our newsletter, civicad.org slash newsletter. Um, we send it out every month and we have lots of, uh, you know, a lot of free things, a lot of resources that, you know, you might not otherwise find out about. Um, and anything new we have, like any new webinar or anything like that, we're going to surface it first in this newsletter. You can also uh, subscribe to our, um, our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Center for Civic Education. Once again, we're promoting the uh, David Wilkins' um, uh, webinar for tomorrow here, but we post you know, just about every day here. There's also a We the People teachers group. It has 358 members currently. Now this group is where you can post, let's say you get stuck on something, you're not sure how to do whatever. You need advice on conducting a simulated congressional hearing, whatever it is. Well, this is a group of We the People teachers. Uh, many of them have a lot of experience, like patients, and um, they are happy to help. You'd be surprised. You just put in your question and somebody will, will pick it up and say, you know, this is what worked for me. And they usually, they usually answer the question much faster than I can, and they do a much better job, too. So there you go. Um, I also want to share with you a few. Um, a few more uh, resources here. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, the kids. Okay, this is the Consource United States Constitution for Kids from our, our friends at Consource. And they uh, have taken the Constitution and broken it down. Now this is, you can get this from our resources page, which I introduced earlier. They've taken the Constitution and broken it down into language that uh, kids can understand. Um, so, you know, for example, this is the uh, preamble. So you've got the preamble here and then more common language here. And then you have primary source documents relevant to the preamble. So what Consource does, they're another nonprofit organization that talks about, uh, basically they have a whole wealth of primary source documents. So these are links to their primary source documents, some of which, most of which, many of which at least we talk about in the We the People books, like the English Bill of Rights. Also from Consource, and this can also be found on our resources page, is uh, a list of primary source documents 
correlated by lesson in the We the People middle school book. So we talk about in lesson one, the Mayflower Compact. Well, if you click on that, you'll go to Consource, which will have uh, the full text of the Mayflower Compact, and then a description of, of what it is and why it's important. This is another, this is a great resource and I hope you can uh, take advantage of that. It just breaks down everything that we mentioned and then stuff that we don't even mention, but that are, that is still relevant uh, to the text. And finally, or almost finally, um, I want to introduce you to my personal um, favorite resource, which is 60 Second Civics. This is a podcast that I host. Um, it is a daily podcast. And a lot of teachers use this as a warm-up activity in their classrooms. So the way you would do that is you would play the, you come to this page, which is civicad.org slash 60 second civics. I'll share that link with you later. Um, and you play the podcast. So warm-up activity, meaning something to get the kids' minds into the mode of learning about civic education or social studies or U.S. government and out of, you know, whatever, playing with their phones or, uh, you know, the latest drama. Um, what, uh, so if you play this for them and then ask them to answer this, um, this quiz. So, you know, what was Abraham Lincoln's primary goal in freeing the enslaved people in the South? Was it to force the Confederacy to respect the human rights of enslaved people? Maybe not, maybe it was, but let's see if we click that, that's wrong. But if you click that, it's right. Um, if you click uh, a, an incorrect answer, it'll ask you to, to listen to the podcast again. Now, one good way to use this is let's say you've got, you teach two different uh, units uh, of social studies. Um, you know, let's say fifth period and then uh, seventh period. So uh, you can play off the fifth period class against the seventh period class. How many correct answers in a row can you get every single day? You come to this page, you take the quiz, the kids agree on what, which answer is correct, and you mark it on the board or somewhere where you remember, and then maybe fifth period's winning, and then maybe seventh period catches up. That's an exciting way to do it. Um, you can download these, you can play them here, you can get it on uh, various apps. You can also search. Let's search for George Washington. Let's see, do we have any, do you think we have any podcasts about George Washington? Nah, probably not. Oh yeah, we have a lot. We have sixty. So um, and you can you can read the descriptions here. Uh, you know, there's George Mason, George Washington popped up in there. Uh, and then we've got George Washington's uh, rules of civility. Another thing we have is this list. Uh, this is our sixty second civics video playlist. So these are audiograms where the words that I am speaking are on the page. And you can just choose mix and match here. Um, you know, choose whatever you want. Like, let's say when the impeachment trial was going on, we've got an episode on impeachment here. Might be a good thing to play in your classroom. All right, everyone, that is all I've got. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Maria Gallo. Uh, Maria, would you like to take it from here? Calling all Maria's. Well, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. You don't need to no. call. Yes, that's part of the problem is that I was too busy trying to figure out how best to share my screen again. Yeah. And for some reason, I'm not able to. Okay. Well, you're, you're back on. Now. There you go. Yes, I'm back on. Yeah, there awesome. I go. So it's, a, you know, that's part of the problem and part of the joy of all of this is the inability sometimes to get things right. Okay. Um, so, uh, Mark told you about a whole bunch of free resources. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit in time to learn.civicid.org, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Civics Forum that is divided into three parts, the content, the pedagogy, as well as the, um, well, in, in today's world, what are the problems of today's world? What's the problems with distance learning? So it is, it's, it goes a step beyond pedagogy to what we're facing today. If you have a split classroom, if, all, if, you're, if you're just teaching um, online, what it is that you can do? Um, Patience, is there anything you would like to say about this? 
Um, yeah, there's um, the forum is a great place to pose questions, to get other ideas from other teachers. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that you're, uh, if you're a teacher out there, you're probably a member of many forums, but if you are really into government, um, and the Constitution and, you know, being part of our We the People family, the forum is a great place that you can have conversations with other teachers. Um, I, I'm the moderator for the forum, and so I get to see everyone's comments and, 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 and help other, help teachers from around the, the, the country. Um, it's just a great way to just have an open dialogue uh, with other teachers that are going through the same thing that you are going through and trying to teach our kids, you know, how to be better citizens using uh, whether it's we the people or just, you know, needing resources or finding articles to help teach our, our students uh, a very important uh, Oh, it looks like uh, Candace is, is having some technical difficulties right now. I'm, I'm very Maria sorry again. about that. Oh, it looks like she might be back. Are you back, Patience? All right. Oh, there you go. You're you're back. Excellent. I can see your I can see your back. Sorry, uh, Patience. Do you want to continue? Did I go away, Mark? I'm sorry. Did, did you I go did. Away? I'm sorry. We yeah, just temporarily, just a little glitch. No, I was just saying that the forum is a great way to share ideas uh, with teachers across the country that are going through the same uh, things that all of us are going through, whether it's COVID or whether it's dealing with controversial topics in your classroom, uh, you know, how to teach the Constitution and other ideas. It's just a great way for teachers to have a deep conversation. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, sorry, Maria, did you want to say something? No, all I wanted to add to that was that. Um, oh. Sorry, Maria, are you there? Yeah, I am here. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. I, I, I inadvertently hit the wrong. The ghost of the this internet is, is wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful because it shows you all of the possible things that we could do incorrectly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, all I wanted to do was to remind people that it's not just pedagogy, but there's also content. So if you as a teacher just happen to have a question or a comment about something that's going on, we are asking you to, to uh, practice civil discourse the same way we would ask you to ask your students to do. But we are, we do at the center uh, and, and we do send it out to scholars if you have content questions as well. Uh, so please do not walk away from that concept at all. We're fine with that as well. Um, I'm going to try the best I can to just finish this off. by actually going back to, uh, and I can't do that. So somehow I have managed to screw this up. But anyway. Is there um, something you want me to share, Maria? Yeah, can you share the, uh, I, I was just trying to go back to the resources and I was the just resources? trying to, but I think that I somehow okay. didn't mean to, but I think I shut down my uh, PowerPoint and I didn't mean to do oh, that. Okay, um, you mean the, the resource, so here's the civics forum, but you mean the resources page on learn. This one right here? Yes, the yeah. resources page on learn, and I did screw this up. I am terribly sorry for doing that. No, no worries, no worries, we're here. All right, so you've got recommended books, free instructional resources, reports, research and articles, and website, websites. Yes, right. that is correct. And so what I wanted to remind teachers is that once they have had the opportunity to, to take a look at that at this forum and they've had the opportunity to look at the open courses that one of the things they might look at is the resource section and once you click on resources it'll give you the recommended books that we might have and it's not just for you it might be books that we recommend for for your students as well they're going to be broken down by grade as well as by adult um, we are also going to um, give you the opportunity to take a look at websites, uh, free instructional materials, and the research and the articles may be important to you. Um, and that is 
then you may want to choose to share some of those research, some of that research with either your parents or your, your principal or your assistant principal, if that's the case, or your superintendent. But anything from this page that could be useful to you uh, with teaching this material or being allowed to teach this material, please make use of it. Um, and then really, I was just going to at this point is um, show them what you had already showed them, which was the link to Amanda Crops. Now she may be, I know that um, in talking about Amanda from mm -hmm. Virginia, she is a high school teacher. Now, right. please do not be afraid simply because she's a high school teacher talking about this because she's talking about the ins and outs of how to use the ebook. Mm -hmm. um, and so she will, she probably makes a lot less mistakes than I did in this whole thing. But um, I want you to recognize the fact that any teacher could learn something from what she is talking about. And so it does not matter whether you're teaching high school or middle school, it's still the ins and outs of the in, of the ebook. How do you use it with your students? What are the wonderful opportunities? Because it's highly interactive. Um, and it really does allow you to connect with your students as well as students to connect with each other. And so that I think becomes very, very important. So you might want to take a look at that. Again, as Mark said, uh, all of these are going to be given to you uh, tomorrow uh, as well. I know he's sending out the PDF of this, but he's also going to send you all the links. So you don't have to worry about, oh my God, I didn't get this link and I need to go back and forth. No, don't worry mm -hmm. about any of that. Just, just, just relax. And then of course, you're back to your decisions and what it does it all mean. Uh, you're the only person, you as the teacher are the only person who can deal with these decisions. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to make the choices and you're going to have to determine whether you, what grade you're going to do it, for how long you're going to do it, what aspects of it you're going to do, et cetera. And whether you, and how you are going to participate in the hearing strategies. And then of course the last, the very last piece that I wanted to do is to remind you of these websites, which of course, since you're gonna get this in, in hand as well as the recording, I don't really have to do very much for this um, other than to say thank you. And if you have any questions, please ask them. Any one of us would be thrilled. Robert, and I just, I just put a link. Sorry, I just put a link to the um, to this slideshow. Um, like Maria was saying, I'll email it out as well. Uh, but I just put a link to this in the chat. Uh, these are some important uh, websites that or uh, URLs that you might want to check out uh, that we've mentioned here. There's Learn. We've got our webinars, our Level Two uh, book, which contains links to a, um, a lot of the resources like the uh, you know, the, the primary source document correlated by lesson and last of all, civicet.org. And I see someone uh, who's joined us, Robert Lemming. Uh, I believe Robert probably wants to say something. Well, thank you, Patience and Mark and Maria for this presentation. Uh, I, th I think what you teachers get out of it, there's a lot of stuff. <clears throat> and I just want to encourage teachers to participate in the We the People program and why. Uh, I'm obviously very biased, but I think that there's nothing more important in middle school uh, or junior highs that you can teach in social studies than about government and the Constitution. Uh, I encourage you as a teacher uh, to invest in your own learning taking advantage of the videos that Mark showed you and other professional development opportunities in your states uh, and what the center puts out. I encourage you to contact your state coordinator to find out what is going on in your particular state uh, with organized hearings or what su other support that your state coordinator can give you. Uh, there's great pockets all over the country of middle school kids participating in the We The People program. And I'll tell you, the reason why it's great is because it allows students to demonstrate their knowledge of government and the Constitution in front of adults and take questions from them in an interactive way. Uh, it is learning at its finest. It's, it's evaluation 
at its finest. Uh, you can't get, I don't think, I don't have a problem with pencil and paper tests. I used a lot of them. But I think using the hearing as an evaluation tool for students is what makes this program the most effective. Uh, it's your responsibility uh, to learn the content. Uh, I sometimes say that students or kids are victims to what teachers don't know. So I'm encouraging you to learn uh, because you can't teach what you don't know. Uh, and and this, this subject matter is complex. It's lifetime of learning, but you get better at it. And as a consequence, your students have the opportunity to actually learn more than you do. Uh, they become experts and they might end up knowing more about a particular topic than you do. And that's the ultimate in education where the, the student becomes, uh, knows more than the master, if you will. So there's a lot of support here for you. Uh, uh, questions to Mark, Maria, patients, myself, anytime. Contact with your state coordinator, contact with other teachers in the network that teach along with you with this. Uh, I, I, I can't encourage you more to, to participate. Uh, and good luck, especially at these tough times, which I know is, is causing issues for all of education. Uh, but I do think it's it's certainly possible, and 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 you should do it. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your participation tonight. Thank you, everybody. Um